Okay. Good morning. Good morning. And for the fourth time we've gotten the video, and um, if you are still well, and we'll give people a couple minutes to join live. Um, but um, let me pray for us, and then um, I'll, I'll share, and then we'll jump into Ephesians. Dear Lord, thank you for um, this morning and the opportunity to um, gather, to be able to um, be in your word together, and, um, and whether in person or um, via, via the internet, that we can um, study, we can grow, um, and Lord, we can pray for one another and encourage one another. Uh, bless us in our study of Ephesians, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, you're going to get an email today inviting you guys to a talk for tomorrow night. You can come live or you can, um, you can watch it later. I want to talk about COVID, reopening, mask wearing, uh, our response to the state, what the Bible has to say about submitting to authorities over us. And, um, you know, some things don't fit well in a soundbite. And, um, and so I thought that, and, and I am concerned about our hearts and the divisions and how the issue of COVID has been drawn into the political stuff. And <clears throat> I have seen some and heard more of even people in the church getting into not the friendliest of discussions via social media over these sorts of things. And um, so I, so I want to lean into it and again say, there's a call that Jesus has on us, and it's not an easy call in these times. And, um, and so, um, you know, I've been doing a lecture series on Thursday nights anyways, and that's all done. And I figured, well, I'll just do a one-off thing and um, and talk about this a little bit and because um, I think there's also the frustrations that are going on in our society as far as you can you can only have 30 people who can come to a funeral or a wedding and and then they'll allow tens of thousands of people to gather in the street celebrating an election and um, and they'll shame one and, and and then they'll just excuse the other but that's the world that's not what we as followers of Christ are going to do. So I want to lean into that. Um, and, and this explains this. Um, you know, at this point, it's not ideal if you're watching on video. And uh, at this point, it's probably not ideal if you're watching in person. Because if you're in person, you get a plexiglass shield. And um, while it's better than this because you wouldn't be able to see my mouth and if you have any problem hearing that's not going to help you um, and then and then this and this is mostly technology we had it all set up with the camera that's been working and then for whatever reason today it wouldn't let me record with my camera from the side and it's done it for the last five sessions so who knows but part of this is um, living into this both commitment as well as concern. Um, we do have a pandemic. Um, people are getting sick. Um, the threats to younger people are very minimal, but the threats to older people are greater. And, um, and so, you know, a, a choice before me was just to stand from outside the plexiglass, but that's not what we've committed to do when we meet in person. Um, and so, so this is what we get every once in a while. I'll look over here and, um, but probably most of the time I'm going to be like this. Um, so with that, good to see you all. And, um, we are in Ephesians four and we are in a section where we are being called to put off the old way and to put on the new way. Um, and I'll begin reading in verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we all members 
of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Um, and let me just stop there. So we, we get it there for, and this part of this study is about teaching us how to read. Um, so that, you know, that, you know, it's great that we can get together. It's great that somebody spends extra time studying to give background information and, and all of that. But part of this is, is to equip you as good Bible readers. Whenever you see a therefore, what should you do? Well, it's there for a reason. You should go back and figure out why is it there. Um, so, you, you, I mean, this is even if you're in your devotional reading and you come across a therefore, it's a good rule of thumb of, okay, wait a second. I'm going to hear God speak to me today. I better understand what this is leading from. Um, and it, it really does go back to, I tell you this, insist on it, that you must no longer live as Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. And I talked last on Monday about this really having idolatry in the background and um, fundamental Old Testament but biblical idea. You become like what you worship. If you worship an idol, you become deaf, dumb, and mute. And, and so you become futile in your thinking. Um, having lost all sensitivity, they gave themselves over to sensuality. This is the same basic principle of that idolatry. We, the, the problem for humans is that we turned away from the living God. And, and, and we were made for worship. And so we will put something as ultimate in our life and we will go after it. And when we replace the living God with something else, it is only an idol and it cannot sustain us. And our hearts grow hard. Um, and, and the biblical uh, pers the, uh, diagnosis is that we, we have a heart of stone. Um, our hearts have, cr have grown um, hard and they don't function the way that they're supposed to. And so there's this old way of life, but you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. You, you heard of him, were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is Jesus. You were taught with your old way of life to put it off and instead to put on Christ. This should be something that we should do every, way, every day. It's about putting off this old way of corruption, of sin, of these false understandings. And instead, it's choosing to live in the light and to follow the light, which means to listen to Jesus and to obey his teachings. Um, put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Um, this is who you are. This is who you're. This is the identity that God has given you. This is who you are in Christ Jesus. One of the one of the most fundamental principles of Paul's ethical instructions through all of his letters is this simple idea. This is who you are in Christ Jesus. Now go and live like it. Um, we, we live in between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. And in this time, we live in a tension. Already we have the Holy Spirit, and yet we do not exist in glory. Already we are being made new and we are alive again, and yet we walk around with the body of death and we have a sinful nature that still pulls us down. And, and in the midst of that tension, your true identity is who Jesus says that you are. You are a new creation. But we sometimes still choose to think in those old patterns. Um, so, you were created in God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, now what happens here is this, Paul's going to give us four different examples of something to put off and then to put on. And, um, you know, this is, this is the part where we're not, we're not limited to these four things, but we could probably assume that in some way these four things are related to some of the situations that are going on in Ephesus because he's applying it to their situation. But we could, we could probably brainstorm more things as well. But here's the scripture, and here's very good wisdom for us. Now, I made this observation um, on Monday that a lot of this has been both the discussion about gifts, and then, and then what just preceded this was around the language of speech. 
apostles, prophets, teachers. Here are these people that have been given, and, 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 they're, and they're there to speak truth. And then there's the way of truth, there's the way of light, and then there's the false teaching, and there's the deluding of thought, and, and now what we're going to deal with is we're going to see a lot of things that again revolve around speech. Um, he's calling for unity in the church. There seems to be some sort of a divide between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. Um, remember this is Ephesus, one of the largest cities of the Roman Empire. This was a place where um, the, the Jews ultimately, most of the Jews in Ephesus rejected and they helped stir up uh, dissension against the Christians. So, you know, there's, there's, this, there's this history. And, you know, think about how easy it is to get caught up in the world's divisions. Um, I, you know, what our world is pushing right now is if you're a Trump supporter or a Biden supporter and I'm on the other side, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And that's coming into the church. No, that's not the way it is for us. Who cares who really won the election? At the end of the day, it's not going to matter in the light of eternity. In light of eternity, we can look back on all of this stuff and say, man, I was way overworked up over something that really was pretty inconsequential, all things given. I, I, I should be concerned for Biden's salvation and I should be concerned for Trump's salvation and I should pray for both of them that they know Jesus and are saved. Along with all that, the whole political class and all of the media and all the people that get you upset, they're not our true enemy. Um, they're our mission field. Now, it's easy though to get caught up in it. Um, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. So, put off, put on. Put off falsehood. Speak truthfully. We're, we're going to get some more advice on this. This is kind of a cover area, and, and then we're going to get into some a little bit of specifics. Um, Sherry. Well, we should, uh, so, the question is, is um, isn't that part of the challenge is, you know, we, you know, what, what truth do we speak? Is it the truth? How do we know if it's the truth? Um, so, in that, I think you, we want to distinguish from some things. So, you may not always know the information, and so you can always preface something. But there's a difference between speaking falsely where you willingly, knowingly deceive versus trying with clear conscience to speak what you believe to be true. Um, and, then, and then, you know, and the context of this as well is, is that, you know, we should be grounded in truth, the truth of Jesus Christ. Um, we may not have all the facts, we may not have all the information, um, but what we look to stand upon is the truth that's been revealed. Um, so my guess is, is that probably in about 95% of the case of the situations that you find yourself in, you pretty much know if you're giving false testimony or honest testimony, right? I mean, if you willingly deceive, then, then you're breaking this. If you unwittingly um, say something that's not true, that that's not nearly so damaging, especially if you preface it. You know, I'm not quite sure about this because I'm not an expert, but I'm functioning under this. But what I do know is, is that Jesus calls me to the truth. So you could change my mind. You could change my mind about whether or not taking a vaccine is a good idea. That would be a good Christian attitude of being open-minded. Um, at the same time, you know, you sit there and you go, you know, I, I thought because of the information this was true, but, but you know, I'm, I mean, I'm not 
staking my life on, on the bits of information that are coming out from the world about data points or whatever. Um, the truth that I'm staking my life on is gospel truth. And, and so, so there becomes those things about, you know, where do you stand and how much pressure or weight do you stand on? But this overall sense, you know, we're reading this, the overall sense of this directive is, is in the contrast, putting off falsehood, putting on truth, not willingly deceiving or speaking things that you know to be false, and instead giving the testimony that you believe to be true, even if you're open to the idea that, you know, I'm not an expert, so I could be wrong. Um, you know, and, and, then, and then it's always good in those situations. You know, I'm, I'm not a medical expert, um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm spending a bunch of time because of the, you know, my position in the church and part of the task force about reading up on all the things for COVID. And, um, you, know, and I, you know, I think I have some information as far as going, you know, there's some studies that, you know, support the idea of mask wearing. There's some that don't. Um, it's become a politicized thing. Mask wearing really is more about if you have it, trying to mitigate the risk of you spreading it to others because the mask does a much better job of limiting the amount of spray that comes out of your mouth. Um, but it re they really aren't made so much to make sure that no particular matters get to you. But we're talking about viral load. And, and they believe that this is a big part of how the transmission works. Now, what I've given you, I believe to be true, um, but I've prefaced it by saying, this is what I've read, this is my understanding, and I think all of us need humility because the nature of science is something where it's, it's an evolving enterprise of knowledge. We're, we're testing, we're learning, we're growing, we're expanding our knowledge base, and we still have unknowns when it comes to COVID. Um, you know, and, and we have to function this way in the world where, you know, we, we try to communicate and we try the best we can to make sense of things and we could be wrong and we're learning. But there's a big difference between that and somebody going, well, you just tried to deceive me. In, in what way? Well, you just told me that, you know, and, and, you, and it's like, I, I, didn't wit, I didn't wittingly try to deceive you. I, I, I unwittingly, if I gave you misinformation, but... But what I was trying to do was give you the best information as I understand it today. I, I, you know, and I think in all those things, I think we get it, right? Um, and I think we know when we're lying. Now. Does this revolve around wisdom, Ralph, about being uh, knowledgeable in what is right and what is wrong? question is, is, does this revolve around wisdom and what is right and what, what is wrong? It does, but it really leans heavily on the aspect of wisdom of not only knowing the right thing, but doing it. Okay, thank you. And, 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 and what I mean by that is, is that, um, why do we lie? Yeah. We typically lie because it's going to be more convenient for us. And there's a very selfish motive to it. Um, so, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Now, the context here is, is this is just how we're supposed to get along with Christians, right? This is this is just this is the this is the kind of the this is, we're, because it, it says neighbor, but then it goes one body, and the only one that we're one body with is with fellow believers because we, we share the Spirit. So this is still in that context of how do we Christians get along. We should speak truthfully out in the world, but then we can start getting into the situations. If the Nazis come and knock at my door and I'm hiding a Jew, do I tell them that I'm hiding a Jew so that they and the answer is no, you don't. Um, you, you know, I mean, you're going you're, you're gonna to be more concerned at that point about stopping evil and somebody doing evil than you are about giving somebody who's obviously doing evil. Now, calls for wisdom. It's difficult. The world's not always an easy place to navigate. Um, you can pray about it. You can, you know, I mean, this is the part where, 
you know, you, you, you look to God for wisdom. Um, I'm going to side on the air of grace in a world of gray. Um, okay, moving forward. Verse 26. In your anger, do not sin. Now, um, so there's an interesting thing that goes on here, and, and Paul in this section will use more than one word that, that in some way means anger, wrath, um, Being, I, I mean, in our English language, the, the euphemisms that we use around the issue of being angry, wrathful, upset. Um, what, are, what are other ones? Um, infuriated. Um, now, in, in this text, you're going to get some of that semantic range of words. Behind this, there is... Um, there, there is a discussion among Greco-Roman moralists about different degrees of anger. Um, overall, it looks like in this passage, Paul really isn't trying to distinguish between different degrees. Um, and he begins with this. Um, when you're angry, do not sin. Now, we know from other scripture passages like James that Typical human anger doesn't lead to the righteous life that God calls us to. But the experience of feeling anger is not necessarily a sin. Um, and so you come to it and, and you get, and, and I believe Paul here is giving us, you know, and this is just good biblical wisdom, good teaching on understanding what the overall Christian approach should anger should be. So let me read to you what he says here. Putting off, putting on. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Okay. So, there's a danger with anger. It, it will lead you down a road of temptation and it will give Satan a way of winning victory over you. Um, the big idea is, is when you're angry, do not sin. It's hard. Um, but anger begins mostly with a feeling, right? You feel, and, and it's typically this, that some <laughs> injustice has been done, usually against me, and it's wrong, and something should be done about it. Um, and in this sense, this is your emotions are more tied to your bodies than just your minds, but your mind helps interpret the situation. Um, but you get this gut feeling and this feeling comes up and anger is this feeling that you have. And, you know, this is, I think, really listening to the wisdom that's being given here. So in and of itself, the feeling of anger is not a sin. It's what you do with the feeling that really is significant. Understanding what anger is, in its purest form, God expresses wrath. Or, I've told you this before, I really love the British pronunciation, the wraith of God. Um, and now God experiences wrath perfectly. Um, he's never flying off the handle. And in this... True wrath is just the appropriate response to evil. Injustice has been done, this is wrong, and something needs to be done about it. Um, evil is not a good thing. And when evil gets done and you feel upset about it, well, that's because you're created in the image of God. God doesn't like evil. Um, it's upsetting. Now, he doesn't fly off the handle. He doesn't lose his control. He doesn't, he doesn't fall into sins himself. You're feeling angry. It is your emergency response system in your body that's telling you some injustice has been done. Now, unlike God, you could be wrong. You could read the situation. Um, 
Now, this is my classic story because this actually happened. So, my wife and I, even before we were married, we had affectionate nicknames for each other, Pokey and Smokey. <laughs> and um, my wife was Pokey and I was Smokey. And, 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 and I always had, to, and even my girlfriend, you know, this, this was before even, I, I always had to wait. I mean, always, you know, when 15 minutes late, always. And, you know, and I'm a person that, you know, I, I would arrive 10 minutes early and then I'd circle the block and then, you know, and then I'd, and then I'd park with like one minute. I didn't want to be like rudely too early, but, you know, I wanted you to know that I was there on time. And, um, and so, you know, this is now years and we're married and I've talked to her and, um, and I'm a graduate student and I work part time and she's working full time and she's coming home and I'm making dinner and, and I have everything ready and I've talked with her and everything's perfect. And it's chicken, and I got it all cooked just right. And it's 5.30, and it's 5.45, and it's 6 o'clock, and it's 6.15. And I'm starting to get angry. Because <laughs> my emergency response is, this is not right. I went through all this work, and now this whole dinner is absolutely ruined. And... Um, you know, and so she gets home and I launch in, where were you? You were just, you're so, you didn't, ah! She had a flat tire and she was stuck on the side of the road and she had to change the tire and, you know, and all my anger left because I was misreading the situation. I thought it was her being inconsiderate, but it was her in a place of uh, desperation. We, we don't always see the whole picture. So when we listen to this emergency response system, we, we should always be cautious of saying, I may not understand everything. Something wrong may have really happened. But the big question is not flying off the handle, reacting to the anger. You listen to the anger, and then you go, okay, what do I do about this? I wanna, I wanna move towards making things right. I wanna move towards reconciliation. I wanna try to stop destructive patterns in relationships. Um, and so, so it, it doesn't mean that you don't do anything, but in your anger, you, you choose not to go the way of sin. I don't see everything, I could be wrong, I wanna to try to understand, and I wanna to try to work this out. Um, so, there's a general wisdom principle. Um, when something is upsetting, deal with it quickly. Now, as a general rule of thumb, probably most of your anger issues probably happen with the people that you spend most of your time with. <laughs> Familiarity breeds a lot of things, and the way that you often treat those closest to you are different than the way that you would treat those farther away. Um, nobody has ever heard me yell at them sure except my family and two other people <laughs> um, and and those were people that I work closely with so I, you know I mean it's the part where it's like I have a great control over my tongue but the people that test me the most are closest to me so here's a general bit of wisdom so don't let the Sun go down on your anger try to resolve it quickly don't don't allow long lists of things but this, this, isn't, this isn't a rule that if you, if, if you actually are in the midst of conflict with your spouse and, and you've been going at it for like five hours trying to resolve this thing and it's two o'clock in the morning and it's like, but we can't go to sleep yet because it says, no, 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 this is wisdom here. It, it, it is good general advice it, but it, it's not, don't take it over literalistically. Okay, we're a little exhausted. We've worked at this for a while. Maybe we need to go talk to a pastor or a counselor or somebody because we're struggling. Um, so, in your sin, or in your anger, do not sin. Roughly, deal quickly with it. it, it you know, 
don't let it fester. Don't let it go on. Because if you do, you're giving room for Satan really to defeat you. Because anger leads to a whole, whole host of unrighteous feelings. It leads to a sense of bitterness and to malice. And, and bitterness and malice have moved from the place of anger actually into sin. Um, those things are described as sins because they are not appropriate. Um, to feel angry is different than to despise. So, you got a question, Joe? The sin, the part you're talking about sin here, now is that the, when you despise something or you blow up? Or, I don't understand the sin part there. Okay. The other, the other question I have was, a person in uniform is angry quite often, but there's, the sin isn't. No. <laughs> okay, so I got two parts here, and they're okay. So where in the when you're angry, do not sin. What's the sin? What's the sin? It's whatever oh, sinful. That's right. So the, the question is, is, you know, in the angry, what is the sin? And the answer is whatever is sinful. <laughs> okay. Um, so th if we begin with the idea of really just saying, okay, so the feeling of anger in and of itself is an emotional bo embodied reaction, which is, and I like this picture, and it's my emergency response system that injustice has been done. That's not a sin. But often what I do next probably is. I fly off the handle, I rage, um, I, I, I attack and try to hurt, um, whether, it's with ver whether it's with words or with something else. And, um, you know, and so in that, that's the part where it's like, okay, you've got the feeling, now what are you going to do about it? And what I want to you to train yourself to do is not to do things that in retrospect you would realize this is falling short of the righteous life that Christ has for me. This, this is about wisdom. And um, so, I, you know, it, it could be any of the above of the things that end up we would say, no, this is not appropriate for the people of God. Um, does that help? I mean, I'm, I, I, kind of, sort of. I, it's I not supposed to, I can't be overly prescriptive. Right. There's you know, so it's, different places in there. yeah. And so it, it becomes this thing. I mean, um, so I'll give you an example that's dealing, uh, so, You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, but I tell you, anybody who looks at his brother and says Raka is in danger of the fires of hell. You idiot! That's Raka. And Jesus is saying, that's not the righteous life that I'm calling you to. So when we, somebody cuts us off, and we sit there and go, you stupid idiot! We're actually ingraining a way of living that is the opposite of what Christ wants in us. Now, the feeling, it gets frustrating to have somebody cut you off. But me lashing out with words, you know, and, and what you do by yourself in the car, now social media has put on steroids, and now you have people saying things to each other through social media that you would probably never say, but you've said for a long time in the privacy of your car, and you're building something up in your hearts that's not good. And then usually it leaks out to those who are closest, and then you say things to those closest to you that you wouldn't say to anybody else, but they end up being hurtful. And, and it's wrong. And so that becomes the part. Um, so I grew up in a family that um, was, was very comfortable yelling. And, uh, you know, and the metaphor was walking around on eggshells so that you, you know, didn't, you know, didn't, didn't get Mount Vesuvius erupting. And um, it, it, I, I'm not perfect at it. My kids will tell you, but I work at it because there's nothing that I do yelling that I can't do better not yelling except when they're upstairs and then I'm just really not yelling, I'm raising my voice. And, 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 and I know the difference between raising my voice to be heard and yelling. Um, second part, 
Joe, Joe is sharing out of his experience of serving in the military that oftentimes there's things that you do as far as in uniform where there's this feeling of, of anger. And, um, and, I, and it's also something that sometimes happens in sports as well. And, um, you know, that, you know, that you, you, you have, and there's probably a little bit of the distinction between the, just the feeling of aggression, but it's a dangerous thing. It, I, I think it is. Um, but, um, it, you know, this is the part where I'm highly competitive and I know there's some dangers involved with competitiveness, but I also know that you can harness that desire to achieve for good things. And so it's not all wrong, it's just how do we allow God's Spirit to utilize these strengths so that they don't become weaknesses and actually sinful flaws. Um, and, uh, yeah. I, so, so in this, this is a call to wisdom, and it's a call of attending to your heart. And, um, and, and this is something that I think in the complexities of the world, this is why it's so important to have the body of Christ and a group of people that you can actually share with some of your concerns about what's going on in my heart as I try to listen to scripture and battle through these things. Um, and, and thoughts can be a sin because of what you're thinking um, before the action. So, so the question is, thoughts can be a sin because of what you're thinking before the um, action. action happens. So what's lust? Is, it, is lust a thought? Anybody? Yeah, but yeah. lust is a thought. Uh -huh. And we're told that lusting is sinning. So the answer is, is yes. Yeah, there, there are thoughts that you... Now, I, 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 lust is not is not the the natural human reaction because God made us male and female that we see somebody of the opposite sex and we think they're attractive lust is what you do after you see them and think they're attractive it's where you start to think about them in a sexual way and you focus your mind on them and or then murder. and well uh, murder is an action Hate isn't. The Malice, deception. Of hate. The thought hate. of of you sitting there and, and, and imagining how you could do evil to somebody. Now, calling for justice and praying for justice, but also praying for mercy, probably. Okay, let me move on. How are we doing on time? Because I don't... Have... Wow, we got through two verses today. This is <laughs> just what I expected, Ralph. That's good. <laughs> Um, it takes seriously, do not give the devil a foothold. Yeah. We have an enemy, and, 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 and it is Satan. And Satan is a destructive, spiritual, personal force mm -hmm. that wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Um, and he tempts, and he looks to tear down the body of Christ as so as to wound and to hurt Jesus. Um, and he wants a foothold so that you live a defeated Christian life. I do not believe that he can steal any Christian from Jesus, but he can wreak a lot of havoc in our lives. Um, 28. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands. Any type of stealing. So, you know, I mean, I didn't really think that they'd miss the stapler. I mean, it's, I know it's the work stapler, but they have like a whole bunch of them. And so I just, you know, took it home. Um, the, the context here is, is, you know, really is speaking into the community situation where it's like, well, I, you know, may, well, I, this is just a really prolonged borrowing. I, you know, and, and, um, and so this is focusing on what we could call just even petty things. Um, I mean, this is the part where it's like, um, 
This is about the habits that we form. What's right, what's wrong. This is actually about being vigilant against the small little things that we do as we live into community, um, where we live differently than how we used to live. Um, and the contrast, stealing must no longer steal, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands. Um, now, from a wisdom standpoint, where you're listening to this and you're thinking about you know, how to apply this thing, the Lord hates um, faulty measures. You, you know, you, you do something and, and you, 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 you do it one way for one group of people and you do it differently for another group of people. And you charge one group of people this and you charge other people this. Because if you charge these people this, then you get this kickback for yourself. And I would say something like that's falling underneath what Paul's talking about. A lot of what they were talking about is this client patron um, sorts of relationships. And Paul does a very interesting thing here as far as working with your hands because he, you know he's actually elevating menial labor. And in the ancient world, working with your hands was not an honorable thing. It was it was it was for the lowly people. You know, if you made it if you were high enough, you wouldn't have to sully yourself by working with your hands. And Paul looks at it and says, no way. I'd much rather have you work with your hands than ever think about stealing or cheating. And if you if you end up stealing and cheating because you're at the top and 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 you're and you're using faulty measures and you're taking advantage of people underneath you, it'd be better for you if you just lost it all and then were just a menial labor. Um Now notice this. This is really significant. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. I want you to put off stealing. I want you to put on work so that you can put on sharing. Um, this leads to the righteous life that Christ requires. This is true justice and holiness and goodness. This is what God looks like. Make a difference in this world. Use the things that God gives you. It, uh, behind all of this, you know, there's the way of Jesus and the call of humility, not considering um, yourself better than others, but actually in humility, looking to put others first. And, and, and that whole attitude of stealing is, how do I put myself first, my needs, my wants, says, no, go work hard and then go and share with those who are in need. Why are you stealing? Because you have need. What do I want? I want you to become self-sufficient, but really Christ-sufficient, so that you're standing on your two feet with the power that Christ gives you so that you can make a difference in other people's lives. <clears throat> 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, what it may benefit those who listen. Okay, what do you think unwholesome talk is? Encouragement? No, unwholesome. Oh, unwholesome. Putting people down. Putting people down. What else? Gossip. Gossip. Pride. 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 Prideful boasting. Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, any, any other? about swearing, coarse jokes, um, we've said gossiping, we've said boasting, we've said um, explicatives, so anything else? I have a hard time when people say, um, in a different frame of mind. Taking the Lord's name in vain? Yeah, that's... And, and you know what else is unwholesome talk? Lying. 
But, you know, he's already dealt with it. So, you know, speak the truth, not false. But, we're, but notice there is, there, there is this... Um, a lot of this direction is centered again around speaking truth, the words that come out of our mouth, the ideas that we spread. Um, so do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Um, you know, this is, this is a little bit... <laughs> you know, your wife asks you the, the impossible question. Does this dress make me look fat? <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a difference there. It, it, and I use that, that as a joke of going... Um, so, I don't have to be unkind, and I can choose carefully my words. And, you know, in some of these old proverbs, you know, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Um, just hold your tongue. You know, does this build up? Does it encourage or does it just tear down? Now, there's a place. And it, we're going to hear it. It's, it's coming to speak the truth in love. Um, go ahead. I think it's or, interesting that in the prior paragraph, we spoke a lot about our actions, and then now we're moving into our speech to make sure that people yep. are included in how we are. Did, did we do speaking the truth in love on Monday? I feel like I did. So that was the overall covering for this. Um, but this is the part where... It, we're aiming for edification, building one another up. Pat? I think the problem is if somebody's opinion is not necessarily true. And so the idea is, to me, is um, unnecessary or unwholesome criticism of whatever it is that's going on. Because it can be your lenses that you're looking through. Or, you know, or a parent or a child that keeps, you know, disintegrating their self-esteem because they're constantly criticizing or not being thankful when something has been done. And, and you know, well, he didn't do it like I would do it. I mean, this, this lens thing, we have to change our lenses. So, here we're listening to all this stuff. And the question is, is what are you going to do with it? How much does this direction shape your life right now? It's, this is important stuff. This, this is about how to live well in community together. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, and there may be one particular thing that's getting touched upon here in this list that applies to your life of an area of weakness where you listen to this and you go, mm, I, might, I might fall into this way of doing things. And, and then to sit there and say, okay, I, you know, here's this call of living differently, to put off the old way of life, to put on the new way of life. And concretely, I go, I struggle with this. Uh, and if you didn't hear this, Pat was talking about, you know, just the overcritical opinions that you give that tear people down. And that would be an example of unwholesome talk. Well, let's say that's you. What are you going to do with it? The call here is, is, to, is, is to start changing and to actually listen and to say, you know what? This is actually one of the biggest areas in my life where maybe I don't look like Jesus. And I'm being called to put off that, that way. Because it ends up, I mean, when you crush somebody's spirit, when you, when you just tear down, we're doing a terrible thing. And so then it becomes, okay, now, now how do I respond to this? Well, the, it, it's a simple thing in one part, but it's going to be really, really hard. It's going to be untraining a bad habit. And it's going to take vigilance, it's going to take prayer, but it is worth doing. Um, man, I, I feel convicted. I, 
I am, I, I, I way give way too much critical opinion and thought and I say mean things. I mean, they end up being hurtful things. I may think that they're mostly true. And some of the things may be true, but I really haven't done well of speaking the truth in love because what I'm doing is tearing down. I'm not building up. The goal is to build up. Um, one of the questions that I ask is, can this relationship handle this much truth? Um, because if I don't know the person well, and I come at them, and then I tell them something, it, that, and if, if, if they don't trust me, it, it can break relationship. It won't build up. Now, I'm going to risk every once in a while to speak more truth than a relationship can handle, but I'm going to do everything I can to show that it's done in love. Because as brothers and sisters, we don't want to see people running off cliffs. And as a pastor, I, uh, it's kind of my job. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's a part where it's like, okay, Lord, are you calling me to say this or is there somebody else? Um, but, you know, those are more of the rare things. Uh, in, uh, but... We, we all know the people who, they're very critical. And you really don't enjoy being around them very much because they're always nitpicking. And this is speaking into that and saying, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, but I just say it like it is. And it's like, yeah, but it's, it's not doing much good, is it? Um, One quick question. Yes. But if you have someone... Yeah. I mean, really bad. Like tearing things apart. Okay. Is, would it be wrong to use Psalms 109 and put his name in there? Okay, so somebody's doing something very, very awful. I mean, that's bad. And, and, and then can I pray like a psalm of, of vindictiveness of, of <laughs> God come down and smoke my enemies and all that. My encouragement to you is pray it to God. Absolutely. Um, and, and bring that anger and bring that frustration so that you can now get to a place where instead of acting out of anger, you can act out of the call that God has for you. Bring all the anger to him, pray it, let deal with it, and then say, okay, Lord, there's, there's, there's what I'm giving you. Vengeance belongs to you. You're the arbiter of true justice. What are you calling me to do in this situation? Absolutely. And I think typically what you'll, you'll find is, is that if you do that, God will probably remind you that you died, he died for that person as well. And, um, and, and he's going to call you in some way to try to go and retrieve a brother or sister who might be running off a cliff instead of just beating them up. But we talked about this the other week, you know, or yeah, Monday. We're going to restrain evil, um, and sometimes you have to use physical force. Now, it might be better to call the police, but if the police aren't nearby, you know, I'm, I'm not going to stand by and let somebody, you know, just continue to do harm to somebody else. Um, but my goal there is not to do evil to somebody; it's to try to stop evil from happening. Um, but, but that's that's a much different situation than me being angry and what do I do with it? Yeah, bring it to God. Pray it. And and she, and you're and the thing is is you got to be honest. God, I'm really 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 upset. I'm pissed. And and I don't normally speak this way, God, but you know how upset that I am. Cuz this is wrong. And um and and you know and and let him help you. Um and, and then be followed and, and guided by the wisdom here in Ephesians. Okay, in my anger, do not sin. Uh, if I, if I, if I'm pretty sure that if I went out the way that I'm feeling right now, it's not going to lead to the righteous life that God wants. So I need more time with God before I go, and I do. Okay, um, let me close this in prayer. Loving Father, thank you for today, and thank you for the opportunity we have to be in your word. Bless us and keep us. And as we struggle together, as we grow together, as we seek to, to um, live into your word, 
May you bless us and keep us and strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen.